Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode in our mini-series here on U20 Football. Brian Clavin, back at it. Let's keep talking football. I know I promised that this is going to be the culmination of our mini-series and move on to a separate topic. But as the questions came in with the Q&A, too many people were asking about uh, certain players. Brian, what about this player? Brian, what about that player? So it rekindled something in me, and it's something that I said in passing over the first few episodes. And today I want to have this discussion because I feel it's too important to overlook. It's levels. Levels, levels, levels. What does that mean? Exactly what it sounds like. When it comes to players, there's disparity in talent between player X and player Y. And we're here to uh, dive deeper in that and break it down as it comes to U20 football. Always though, guys, I want to be clear. It comes with the context, and I've said it over the course of time, that to graduate, and I think as a fan base, and in this country, everybody wants to graduate to the next level in international soccer, okay? We don't want to stagnate. We want to move forward. We miss the World Cup. And to graduate to the next level, I've said it clearly. It's possession-based football. The leadership has said they want to go in that direction. Greg Berhalter, I said it. It was music to my ears in his inaugural press conference. And moving forward, player selection is huge, okay? And I've discussed the importance of player profiles. We need to get straight to it. Players with brains and soccer IQ and players with high level technical quality need to be the ones that are selected, okay? I took it to the extreme and I went over my U20 lineup and that's what we're gonna discuss at length today. I'll probably go on those side tangents and rants just to get my point across. But guys, at the end of the day, the basis of everything is I want us to graduate. That's why I got involved in the game. I envision myself helping the US, you know, have World Cup success, be it at the U17 level, U20 level, or the senior men's national team level. That's how I was raised. The World Cup is everything. The culture I was raised in, Argentine background, it's all about that international success. Club football is one thing, but when it comes to your national team, the pride of the national anthem, getting to the next level is something we need to all not just talk about here in the US, is move in the right direction. And I have that, I have that feeling that we are. Okay, I just want to break it down to another level. Here we go, U20 football. I'm going to give an example. Okay, so we have our starters, the guys that I named. The starters are, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 out of 10. And then I will give you their sub as of today and what, how close or how far I see him. So for context, Mark McKenzie was a center back in our previous U20 cycle in Poland. Leading up to the tournament, it was him and Chris Richards. He had his appendicitis. He had to take a seat. He wasn't match fit. He couldn't start the games. In comes Abubakar Keita, okay, his sub. So if Mark McKenzie's a 10 out of 10, Keita would be a five out of 10 in my opinion. Why? We saw why. It was a possession-based team. It had a lot of success leading up to the tournament. Good technical players in the back, good technical players in the midfield. However, when we talk about levels and playing at the next level and playing a World Cup, the ball would get to Abubakar Keita and it was massive deficiency. This guy was a weak link and it all fell apart at the highest levels in the big games. Sure, Abubakar Keita's got great physical attributes, but when it comes to technique, or when it comes to soccer brains and soccer IQ and understanding the game, it's below average, to be honest, okay? I think I'm not the only one that felt he was a fish out of water playing on that team in the World Cup. So let's break down our current U20s, okay? David Ochoa, consensus number one pick, 10 out of 10 points. His competitors, uh, Big C, Chitoro Andensi, five out of 10. Damian Loss, five out of 10. John Polskamp, Four out of 10. Does that mean that these guys are terrible goalkeepers? Not at all. It means that they don't fit the profile of a player to play in a possession-based system to get the job done and graduate us to the next level. These guys are good in their own right. They're in good professional environments. They're talented. Hey, maybe they're better shot stoppers than David. Maybe they're better in the air than David. But when it comes to soccer IQ, reading the game, uh, understanding the moments of the game, uh, distributing, build outs, it's not even close, and it'll never be close. Guys, I also wanna be clear. Uh, I know I said that there's time, that players can close levels, that maturity is important, club environment important, training environment's important, all of that is true. But once you get to 20 years old or beyond that, there's small margins that you can improve when it comes to technique or when it comes to IQ. Point blank, that's it. People wanna talk about, hey, you can't teach athleticism, but you could teach the other stuff. No chance. Because let's just use this as an example. Big C. He could train all day, every day uh, for the next 10 years. He's never going to catch up and close the gap to uh, what David Ochoa is and the skill set he brings to the table. It's just not happening, right? I gave you the example of Joe Hart at Man City. If he, listen, he's a great goalkeeper, he's a Man City legend, he's the England starter. 
if Pep felt and his staff felt that, hey, he's a good goalkeeper and we'll teach him how to build out or how to see the game or how to read the... If they felt they could do so, they would have done so. No chance. They bring in somebody that's competent, that fits that criteria for a possession-based system. So moving forward, I hope that's clear. David Ochoa is the guy and the other guys aren't even close. Left back, Kobe Hernandez-Foster, 10 out of 10 points. Travian Sosa, 7 out of 10. He's got a good skill set. Technically, he's okay, athletically great, but he's not there to displace Kobe, and it's going to take a monumental effort in terms of him doing so for our system and to graduate us to the next level. Uh, you want to take it a step further? George Bale, 4 out of 10. So distant, guys. And I'm not picking on George. We'll talk about the U-17s at the end of this program, but you side at the World Cup. This guy can't have solutions, can't face forward, can't break lines, technically can't get out of situations. He can't think the game fast enough to get out of situations at the highest level. So George athletically, high level, but we want to graduate. And he doesn't have the technical foundation, nor does he have the soccer IQ to graduate us. Okay, moving to left center back, Leo Sepulveda, 10 out of 10 points. I won't go into detail, but I've already said he is the guy. He's the best center back, not only in this pool, I think beyond this pool in terms of possession soccer, in terms of soccer IQ, in terms of technical capacity, breaking lines, seeing the game, reading the game. He is just so high level. We don't have any other left center back, but let's just shift in a right footer. Jacob Akingridge, San Jose uh, kid, super athlete, four out of 10, not even close. He can only play his neighbor. If he's a center back, he can only play the other center back. He can only play his outside back. He can only play negative to the goalkeeper, which is the majority of the time under any type of pressure. I saw it in the friendlies in January against Mexico or the senior men's national team. He cannot break a, life, a line if his life depended on it. No knock on Jacob. He's a great athlete. He's the same old, same old what we had in the past, but we want to graduate. That's what we say. So if we want to move to the next level in soccer, we cannot have a player of these qualities being on our U20 starting and have the uh, Abu Bakar Keita part two. It's just reality. Shifting to right center back, Owen Otasawi, 10 out of 10 points. His backup, more of the same. George Campbell, great athlete, great prospect. If you want to be the same thing, if you want status quo, if you don't want to improve globally in the, in, in the terms of uh, soccer, but he's not going to get the job done, guys. Owen's a lot more technical. He's a lot better in terms of breaking lines on the dribble, reading the game, and it's just not going to happen for a guy like George in a possession-based system. End of story. Five out of ten for him. Okay, moving to and we can go into other guys that were at the U uh, twenty or U seventeen World Cup. Tavon Gray, four out of ten. Hey, if he's going to win duels in the air. He's your guy. If he's going to turn and hunt somebody down 50 meters because we're playing a transition back and forth game, Tavon Gray's the guy. But if you want to play possession-based football, it was a nightmare in Brazil. Okay, It looked like he had a peg leg. He had to swing his leg. It was so awkward. His technique is so poor, and he's never going to catch up. It's just not his skill set. On the athletic side, what an athlete, what a player, but that's not what we're looking for here. Okay, Shifting to right back, Julian Araujo, 10 out of 10 points. His competitors, Cam Duke, I would say 8 out of 10 because Cam Duke is very technical. He sees the game. He understands the game. Julian beat him out, and that was clear because he gives his team balance. Julian covering Gio on that right channel. Julian shifting inside and covering when Kobe gets forward. Gio, I mean, uh, Julian just gives us that, that unique balance that this team would need, okay, in terms of its makeup. Uh, Cam is good, 8 out of 10. The next guy in line, if we shift to the U-17s, uh, the O2s, it would have been Joe Scally, four out of 10. Guys, again, no knock on Joe. He has different gifts on the physical side. Uh, Borussia paid big money for him. Fantastic, that Mönchengladbach, that's their prior profile. But for us to graduate and get to the upper echelon on the international stage, we can't have Joe Scally at right back. You saw it in Brazil, and if you didn't see it, I'll remind you, ball would come out of the air, he couldn't even trap a ball out of the air. Ball would come in terms of the build-out. He was always body position facing neg negative. He could never face forward. He could never break a line. It was a mess. And he just does not graduate us with his player profile. Moving forward, let's get to the central midfield. Taylor Booth, 10 out of 10 points. His competitors, Tanner Tessman, 6 out of 10. Oscar Cervantes, 6 out of 10. Both good players in their own right. Both with good phys physical attributes. But the thing that distinguishes Taylor of these two guys is under pressure in extreme situations, Taylor can get out of things. He can play forward. He can take you off the dribble. He can break a line with his passing. He can play a diagonal under pressure. His first touch can elude pressure. 
where these other guys struggle, and I think at these highest levels, when we play higher level international competition, they're not ready for it. So that's why they're rated below uh, Taylor Booth. Moving to the eighth spot, Indy Vasilev, 10 out of 10. It's a close one there. I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10 for Johnny Cardoso, the Brazilian silky smooth Inter de Porto Alegre guy. He has the attributes. He is technically very sound. He is tactically very sound. He has a soccer IQ. He gets the game, he understands it. I saw it live and personal in Miami during a week long camp with the 23s. This is the type of player that fits the profile we need to graduate to the next level. Take it down a notch. Uh, Cole Bassett, six out of 10. Physical attributes strong. Lung capacity can run box to box, doggies, all that, but he doesn't have the technique to get us to the next level. He doesn't have the brain to get us to the next level. Shifting to the 10th spot, I said what I had to say about Efra. No need to beat that uh, drum again. Uh, his competitors, Matt Gomilhilovic, six out of 10. Thomas Roberts, six out of 10. Uh, shifting it down, uh, Marcelo Palomino, five out of 10. Gianluca Busio, five out of 10. There is a big gap in terms of being the 10 and delivering the final ball, killing it with your own finishing. Yeah, I have already told you what effort brings to the table, and these guys do not, okay? Uh, somebody else that could be considered a 10 or a winger uh, that I really rate, that I really think has the attributes, that graduates us, that helps us, is Jose Gallegos, okay? So if we don't have Ephra, if we don't have G uh, Gio or Uli, he fits in, seven out of 10 points. I still think Jose needs to work on his finishing, his final product there in the box, and picking out that final ball and executing it consistently. But Everything else he brings to the table, he's the guy to fill in if we don't have one of those three guys. On the wing, we have Gio Nulli, the undisputed starters, 10 out of 10 points. They're uh, backups, which for CONCACAF standards, which, I mean, I already said, in CONCACAF, we're going to qualify. We're going to get to the World Cup. We're going to uh, smash everybody. We're going to get the three-peat on Mexico. But these guys are so far from it in terms of the most important attributes, having technique, having brains. Conrad de la Fuente and Cam Harper, 4 out of 10 compared to Gio Nulli. Okay, they're far from it, guys. They could be substitutes to get it done in CONCACAF to beat that drum. But at the international level and graduating us to the top where I want to go, no chance with those guys. All right, let's get to the ninth spot. Ricardo Pepe, Cavani, 10 out of 10. Uh, his competitors, Matthew Hoppe, 4 out of 10. And the same thing for Johan Gomez. Okay, technically and up here, they don't have it. Great, Matthew Hoppe's a goal scorer. I don't know if he fits the criteria to combine with these guys to have the right hold up play to come. I just don't see it. Johan Gomez, I told you, mobility, work rate, but not a goal scorer on a consistent level that we need for our nine. Charlie Kelman, I wouldn't even rate, you know, because honestly, uh, I haven't seen him play live and I don't, I don't wanna go there. I will give you my verdict on Charlie Kelman when I get to see him up close and personal, okay? We could even talk about the other wingers that were at the U17 World Cup, but I don't want to, guys. Those guys don't have it. We saw it in Brazil. I won't even name them. Move on, okay? I hope everybody understands that, you know, this is all in the context of graduating us to the next level. I'm not trying to slight any of these players. Everybody's talented, everybody's good in their own right, everybody's their unique player profile, and some of them will have success in certain systems. But with Greg Berhalter, with the direction that we're heading, that we all are excited about, I don't know about all of us, but I'm excited about, there's no room for guys that don't have technique. There's no room for guys that don't have brains. There's no room for just athletes. I read a story I don't know, today, yesterday, uh, about the only way we get back to uh, competing on the international stage is through a never say die attitude. We gotta grind, we gotta hit. What are we talking about? You guys don't think that at Trinidad and Tobago that day, the guys on the field didn't wanna grind? You don't think DeAndre or Christian or Michael Bradley or Darlington Nagby or Josie or Bobby Wood, these guys weren't grinders. Everybody wants to work hard. That's non-negotiable, okay? Especially when you put on the jersey. That's absurd. We have to define our system. We gotta have our identity. Another topic I heard Taylor Twelman talking about as well. Identity comes every four years during the World Cup. Maybe for the casual fan, the identity is instilled every single day in terms of your environment, right? The coach, our current coach, actually has an idea of what he wants to do tactically. His predecessors, I can't say the same for them, okay? But Greg Berhalter has an idea. He has a system. Now it's time to select the right players for that system. And here's where I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent before we get back to the levels conversation. Possession football, Weston McKinney. Okay, somebody everybody knows, high level player, Bundesliga player, Schalke, has played in the Champions League, has 
achieved a lot for his young career, okay? And this is a guy that plays every single week in the Bundesliga. So we're not going to debate that he has quality to have achieved that level of play on a consistent basis. But if you think of Weston, it's physical. His qualities are special on the physical side. He can get in bone-crunching tackles. He can win duels in the air. He could run doggies 18-yard box to 18-yard box all day long. That's what makes Weston unique in his own right, and it's going to make him a good pro for a long time. He's going to have a great career. Okay, But think about Weston on the technical side. He's very average okay, at best. Think about uh, Weston on the soccer IQ brain to play a possession-based system. Average at best. So does he fit the profile of a midfielder that we need? My answer is no. A lot of people are going to say, oh, Brian, you just want to knock Weston McKinney. You sound just like your brother. You don't know what you're talking about. No, I have a very clear idea of what I'm talking about. Okay, listen, we can take dive a little bit deeper for an analogy. Jossi Sardis. People are crushing Jossi Sardis. His technique is terrible. They make YouTube videos about his first touch. He's not the guy. How is he the guy? Why is Greg keep calling this guy? I'll tell you why. Greg calls this guy because he understands his system tactically. He's been playing under Greg for a while. I don't think Greg has the vision of Jossie being the guy come 2022. We don't know that. But my question to you guys is, why is it okay to crush Jossie and his technique and why he fits this system? But Weston's okay. Nobody crushes Weston that he turns the ball over left and right. His passing percentage is subpar. He doesn't see the game. He loses duels. He doesn't trap. Nobody criticizes that. You know why? Because everybody in our country, there are a few exceptions. They base everything based on pedigree. Weston plays at Schalke, so Weston must be good. If Jossie was at Schalke, would the cri critics be the same on Jossie's game? What do you guys think? Okay, hey, I don't want to just pick on those guys. I'm not picking on those guys. I think Jossie's a great guy. He used to come and be very active with the Galaxy Academy, the young guys, just a good role model, a good human being. Let's talk about my guy, Efrain Alvarez. What he is, I already said what he is. Efra could train all day, every day for the rest of his life. He will never in a million years be able to do what Weston does. He can never win bone crunchy tackles. He can never win duels in the air. He can never run doggies 14 kilometers a game. He just can't do that. It's not his skill set. And Schalke will never buy Efrain Alvarez, nor will most Premier League clubs or other Bundesliga clubs. It just doesn't fit into their soccer style and what they're trying to do, okay? But Schalke is a mid-tier German club. They're not the elite. They're not aspiring. They're not growing to the top level. That's what we want for the U.S. I want us to be amongst the best. Sure, when we face Spain or France or Argentina or Germany or Brazil, we're probably not going to boss the game with this possession-based system. On that day, we let's fight for the possession battle. Let's fight to impose ourselves on those guys with our identity. We're probably going to lose the battle, and that's okay. But the rest, I think we can do it. We have the players that do it. We're just overlooking them, okay? I'll take Michael Bradley 10 out of 10 times over Weston McKinney in my midfield. Why? Because he has an IQ. He can see the play. He can pick a pass. He's suited for a possession-based system. I'll take Darlington to Nagney. 10 out of 10 times over Weston McKinney to play this style of football. End of story. Those are the attributes we need to graduate us to the next level. We can continue on this discussion when I get to the next series, but let's dive back into the U20 fold, okay? Into uh, the levels the argument. Uh, let's talk about the U17s, okay? Let's talk about the U17s in Brazil last, uh, last October it was. We had a lot of hype going into it. We had a new coach. European guy, different ideas. We played lights out at CONCACAF. We had one touch sequences, played Mexico off the park. Could have been, could have, would have, should have been four or five zero at halftime for the U.S. It wasn't. We missed our opportunities. We lost the game, but whatever. The players, everybody's on the hype train. These are incredible players. The future is bright. I can't wait to see these guys on the senior side. Then we go to Brazil where we fate line up against Senegal. We line up against Japan. We line up against the Netherlands and we were terrible. Terrible to the point where there was no possession-based football. We try to build out. We didn't have the player profiles to build out. Out of the back five, out of the goalkeeper, uh, whether it was Las or uh, a big C, the left back, Bayo, Kobe at center back, uh, Tavon Gray at center back, and Joe Scali, just the back five alone, 
Only one guy can play out. Only one guy has the technical attributes or the, the soccer brain to be able to do it at a high level consistently, and that was Kobe. Wherever else the ball went, and it fell apart. We, we had possession in our own half. We couldn't go forward. We were shocking guys, and it was the most embarrassed I have ever been watching the game against the Netherlands where it was 0 4, it could have been 0 8, 0 9, 0 10. I was there in the stadium as a U.S. soccer practitioner, fan, associated to the game, wanting to get us to the next level, help us get us to the next level. It was the most embarrassed I've ever been, and I will never forget the, the feeling I had that night. It was, it was just indescribable. So, to graduate us guys, we can't just talk that we want it. We have to actually walk the walk. I've been very clear what it has to be. We need these types of players. We need to select the right ones because we have them. We can't turn the blind eye. And I'm talking about all across the board, not just at center mid where I use Wesson as an example. At center back, let's take this for an example. 19-year-old Rafa Marquez, his player profile, a snail, physically a snail, okay? But technically incredible and reading the game, high level. He sees the game and his lack of pace doesn't matter because he could put out fires before they even happen. 19-year-old Rafa Marquez or 19-year-old Aiko Para, who is chosen historically in our country? I'll give you a couple seconds. 10 out of 10 times in this country, we would choose Aiko Para and that's where the problem lies. That's where we'll never graduate to the next level, okay? If we think about a right back, who do we prefer? A 19-year-old profile of a Dani Alves like this, like Cam Duke? Or a 19-year-old Kyle Walker, physical specimen, can fly up and down the channel, can whip in a ball in the mixer with no purpose? Or do we want Dani Alves that picks up his head and can, can connect wherever he wants, inside of the foot, outside of the foot, driven, pause, reset, put a foot on the ball? Or, oh, there's the run of my nine, boop! There it goes, right into your path. Or, hey, I'm gonna whip in a ball, it's going right to the weak side winger to finish it off with purpose, with intent. The things I described about effort at the 10. When are we gonna have a two like that? Hey, we're moving in the right direction. Serginho Des is an improvement technically to the profile we had, but speaking of Serginho, a year ago as well, people were slating and crushing this guy at the U20 World Cup. He can't defend. Look, he got exposed versus Ukraine. He's terrible, he's this, he's that. Fast forward a month later, Ajax brings him in out of necessity to their preseason camp. Nico Tagliafico, the Argentine international, uh, international duty Copa America. They needed a body, they brought him. He seized the opportunity, he played well. He debuted, he killed it in his debut. And he had a great season for the most part, consistent. But before that, terrible. That's what most of the media in our country was saying. Negative, negative, negative. Now he's the best dual national recruit. He's a national pride and joy. And Serginho is a good player. He's gonna help us drive, drive our national team level forward. Okay, that's the reality. Last thing I'm gonna say, guys, we wanna graduate, but we have to be open-minded, okay? Uh, in Argentina, Sergio Aguero, El Kun Aguero. Do you know, do you guys have any idea how badly this guy gets crushed? People say he is a fraud. He is terrible, he has failed us. He's only on the team because he's Messi's friend. All kinds of nonsense. Okay, they crush this guy. And that's Sergio Aguero, legend at Man City, goal scorer, leads the Premier League every single year consistently. I think he's the highest scoring international ever over Henri in the history of the Premier League. This is the level we're talking about. We're talking about levels, and in that country, they crush him. But now people are gonna get offended if maybe somebody says Weston McKinney's not the right profile for our national team. Speaking of profile, I think of another idea, Raul. Real Madrid legend. I think everybody knows who Ra Raul is, okay? He was dropped before the 2008 Euro Cup because he didn't fit the profile of what Luis Aragonés wanted in his forwards. Dropped, and he was 30 years old, still in his prime, still scoring goals for Real Madrid. He didn't fit the profile for that possession, Diki Taka team. End of story. That's it. So we have players, guys. Don't tell me, well, Brian, who should we have if we don't have Weston? I already named a couple today. We're gonna take a deeper dive as it, as it projects forward to Qatar and beyond, but this is not the profile that graduates us to the next level. I need everybody to understand that. We need to start prioritizing the two most important components. Brains, meaning soccer IQ, understanding the game, and their technical qualities. Because the best midfielders in the world, the ones that we wanna to aspire to graduate us to the next level, are your Rakitic's, your Tony Cruz, your Modric's, 
your Arturs, your Frankie de Youngs, your Pianics, your Marco Veratis, your Xavis, your Iniesta's, your Riquelmes, and all those guys, guess what? Technique and brains, physically snails for the most part, athletically, not the highest levels, okay? Guys, I'm tired of talking about it. I wanna see action. I wanna see us graduate. I hope this episode opens some eyes. There are levels to this game as it pertains to our U20s, our senior men's national team, and beyond. And we need to aspire to be at the highest levels and stop making excuses and stop saying we just need to grind it out and have a never say die mentality and stop saying that identity only comes every four years at a World Cup and since we missed the World Cup, we don't have an identity. Nonsense. We're taking the right steps. I hope leadership continues to drive us forward. They don't take a step back because we failed a couple of times against Mexico in the Gold Cup or in a friendly. Keep moving forward. Keep doing tactical work. Keep elevating our country and keep picking the right players. The jury is out. No more blind eye. Pick the right guys. Uh, guys, I want you to follow up. The Q&A, I promise, will be next week. Open subject. Nothing is taboo as it pertains to our U20 uh, mini series. Beyond that, we can get to that in the future. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Peace.